Hi there. My name is Grant Lindsley, and I'm here on a Carleton Career Center externship program in Bombay, New Zealand, at Vimuti Buddhist Monastery. Ajahn Chandiko, Carleton class of 1984, a Buddhist monk and abbot of this monastery here, has hosted a Carleton externship in this picturesque location. So what's this all about? Come on, I'll show you. So, why am I here? Why is the Carleton Career Center paying for a psychology major to go to New Zealand to visit a Buddhist monastery for three and a half weeks? What's the rationale behind that? What does that have to do with a career? Well, I'll tell you why. The Carleton Career Center has adopted a broad mentality when it comes to what makes a good career. They think that a career is more than what you do from nine to five, what you do to pay the bills, but it can be something that's an integral part of who you are, what you care about, and how you're a benefit to the greater world and community at large. My role as a Buddhist monk is to practice for liberation, uh, which is um, a long-term goal of inner peace, uh, wisdom, freeing of consciousness from ordinary uh, mundane misperceptions that tend to bind us to a, a certain way of living that doesn't really lead to happiness. <clears throat> so in a sense, my, my job as a Buddhist monk is to uh, learn how to be happy and then to teach others how to be happy. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm still working on it. Yeah. <laughs> but it's a gradual process. Um, I've been a monk now for 21 years. And in the early years of being a monk, my main responsibility was just to be a good monk and, and uh, to put my heart into practice, <clears throat> the Buddhist practice. A lot of intensive meditation very different lifestyle than the middle class, upper middle class <laughs> um, society that I was educated with. <laughs> and then in the last seven years, as my role as abbot has been much more directly concerned with creating situations that are a benefit to other people. Uh, it always goes hand in hand, you know, benefiting oneself <clears throat> truly benefiting oneself uh, and truly benefiting other people will always will always go hand in hand. I mean, you can't really have one without the other. The more we try to help other people, we're helping ourselves if we're doing it wisely. Yeah. And the more we really help ourselves by purifying our heart, reducing anger, reducing our greed, reducing our delusion, then we're that's about the best thing we can do to help other people as well. Yeah. People at Carleton will be interested to know how you actually became a Buddhist monk, what path you took. So could you give an explanation of the path that you took and the process, kind of from just experimenting with meditation to where you are now? Mm. Yeah, I can blame it all on Carleton. <laughs> <laughs> When I was probably sophomore around that time, started getting more and more interested in um, Eastern religions in particular. I think I took a course in comparative religion. Uh, certainly Buddhism stood out for me as um, of the world religions that really interest me. Uh, seemed very practical, uh, also very profound. So that interest gradually grew, and then uh, I started meditating on the side a bit. <clears throat> Occasionally, a Japanese uh, Roshi, Japanese teacher uh, from the Zen tradition, would come down and give a talk at Carleton. He was a good friend of Bardwell Smith's, and uh, never quite understood what he was trying to say, but. Uh, he seemed very happy, and 
it seemed like there was a lot of potential there. So initially, I became quite interested in Zen. In fact, in my senior year, Katagiri Roshi came and taught a course at Carleton. And as part of that, he would come and lead us in meditation earlier in the morning, and then uh, actually teach a course. So that was fantastic, really. You know, actually, <clears throat> it wasn't just getting credit, but actually merit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, of course, I had uh, uh, some wonderful, wonderful professors. And Bardwell Smith, in those days, was uh, considered half divine. You know? and, uh, and Roger Jackson, in my senior year, was his first year at Carleton. And he taught a course on mysticism, which was wonderful. And, uh, so, uh, of uh, professors that, that were very inspiring and helped to plant pull some seeds into my consciousness. I'd say Bardwell Smith and Roger Jackson. You know, I have a lot of gratitude to them for that. Yeah. Uh, once I, well, <clears throat> I started off majoring in political science. Really? <laughs> yeah. I don't know, somewhere along the line, I, I seemed to feel that that wasn't the path to ultimate happiness. <laughs> I may have been wrong, but, but uh, I decided to, to change my major to religion, mainly so I could study um, Eastern religions more in depth. Uh, my advisor did everything he could to dissuade me, but I stuck to it. <laughs> and uh, um, of course, you know, they were saying, well, <clears throat> religion such an impractical major. What are you going to do with a religion major? In the end, I'm probably one of the few people who's actually working in the field <laughs> what he majored in. <laughs> so, So I majored in, in religion, focusing on Eastern religions. When I graduated then, uh, this six-week uh, Zen retreat led by Katagiri Roshi was happening in southern Minnesota. So without much meditation experience, I just decided to go ahead and, and dive into that, which was a pretty radical change of lifestyle, because while I was at Carleton, I wasn't living very much of a monkish lifestyle by any means. But, uh, but you know, it was interesting at the 25th Carlton reunion, a lot of my old friends, you know, even the ones who were just more like music friends or party friends, they said, you know, I'm not surprised you're a monk, I could always see it there. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, maybe they were seeing something that wasn't yeah. completely clear to me at the time. Yeah. And then after graduation, so I did this uh, intensive, very intensive six-week meditation course. And that was pretty difficult, but it was also great. It was just wonderful. And I really took to the monastic lifestyle in a way that surprised me, surprised everyone else too. <laughs> you know, showed up out of the blue with long hair and my drumsticks still in my back pocket. Really? <laughs> <laughs> so, they, uh, they, they think, well, how long is he going to last? <laughs> but uh, then, you know, I really took to it. Uh, so then, from that point on, I, I gradually did traveling around the States, traveling in Europe, but I would keep coming back and and doing these long retreats and further retreats for like two months uh, from that point on and a lot of shorter retreats. And after the end of the first retreat, I, I thought, well, you know, I could actually be a monk myself. Maybe when I'm 65, <laughs> and I retire, yeah. and I've done everything. The kids are grown up. <laughs> and uh, then after the, a year later, after the second long retreat, it was much more profound, and I thought, well, life is short, it's fleeting. Um, the path of practice isn't quite so easy. It really takes quite a few years of dedication. Maybe I should think about being a monk by around age 35 or so. 
Yeah, give myself another, you know, 12 years or something, you know, just to uh, continue developing life experience. And, and then I, I was, you know, traveling, getting lots of experience, doing wonderful things, not getting right into a, a full-time job, but um, doing a lot of wonderful things. <clears throat> And then after my third long retreat there in southern Minnesota, I uh, started to see that, well, if I'm, if I'm going to do this, or if this is really what I consider to be the most important thing in life, what am I waiting for? You know, why don't I just dedicate myself to do it full time right now? Which, you know, it's kind of a, a radical thought to arise in my mind because it entailed giving up a lot of things that I assumed I really couldn't give up or didn't want to give up. I always had assumed I'd have a family, um, we'd keep playing music, uh, etc. Yeah. And so it was a surprise to me as well when gradually the importance of practicing um, the Dhamma, the teachings of the Buddha, eclipsed my interest mm -hmm. in other areas. But it was a it was a very gradual process, a very natural process. And so by the time I've been meditating for a few years, I just felt quite mm -hmm. felt quite happy to to say, well, this is something that is really worth dedicating myself to dedicating my life to and uh, it just had such tremendous potential and depth and could be taken to many many different levels <clears throat> so you spoke some about how your experience at Carlton influenced the path that you took can you talk some about non-academic impacts that the Carlton culture or the lifestyle may have had and the path that you chose after graduation? Yeah, I think uh, just the general open-mindedness of Carlton is very helpful. Uh, I spent a lot of time communing with nature in, in the Arab. Hill of Three Oaks in those days was almost a spiritual place. Really? Because we didn't have the, the rec center there, and where the rec center is now is pretty much all just forest. So Hill of Three Oaks was like surrounded by forest. Uh -huh. And there were actually three oaks, big oaks there. <laughs> and uh, it just had this almost like sacred feel about it. There were also probably just some things which were educational in, uh, in the sense of finding out what I didn't want to do. I was a musician and um, Tended to hang out with more, a bit more of the wild crowd, and you could see at some point that you know there's a certain uh, destructiveness of the lifestyle, you know, just with um, being too hard on one's body. Or, you know, and, uh, so I also saw that you know there are certain things that I really didn't want to pursue. So that was helpful in that way as well. Yeah. So it sounds like exploration is a, is a definite theme that helped you find your own path and that Carlton was able to provide a culture that is accepting and even encouraging of exploration. Mm. Yeah. That was helpful. Yeah, I, I feel really fortunate that I ended up at Carlton and there was such an um, encouragement to explore and uh, to have a bit of individual creativity in which, what we were looking into. And this was even a bit more of a conservative time. This was like the Reagan years. <laughs> but um, there was still very much that, that undercurrent there at Carleton that encouraged free thinking. I suppose exploration and um, 
even after graduation, was still very much part of what I was doing when I was traveling. You know, I would do that as almost like a spiritual practice, or a practice for you know, for personal growth. And uh, it really was really learned a lot about myself just through traveling. So I, I wonder what what you think, you know, a career should be, to to somebody who may <clears throat> who may not go into the monastic lifestyle, but who still wants to do something beyond making money. Hmm. Well, I think almost everyone can see that the world's in a, in a bit of a mess in many ways. And so we need intelligent, motivated people to, to work, do something for the benefit of, of everybody. Because, uh, I mean, the whole world is so interconnected now, so, so much more obviously interconnected that uh, uh, finding ways to be of benefit to others in some way is going to obviously be useful to others, but probably be much more satisfying personally much more conducive to happiness than if you were working for a corporation and you knew that the corporation had certain investments which led to the impoverishment of certain third world countries or um, was producing pesticides so that led to a lot of health problems for people. Or, you know, so it, it's much easier to look yourself in the mirror and feel really good about yourself and have a a positive sense of self-esteem with um, a career which you really feel good about. Yeah. Much more important than making money. Yeah. I mean, you only make money with the idea that this is going to make you happy with what you can buy with the money. <clears throat> but it's a good question to ask, how much do we need to be happy? Yeah. You know, if we have clothes on our back and a roof over our heads and enough food. Uh, how much how much do we need in addition to that to be happy? It's something that everyone has to figure out for themselves. But certainly uh, whatever we do for a living, we're making a lot of karma. I mean every everything we do with an intention, everything we say with an intention, even what we think, uh, is making karma. And if, if we're working something, uh, working at something 40 hours a week, we're making a lot of karma doing it. And so if we're smart enough or fortunate enough to have a job where we can be making good karma as well as supporting ourselves, then uh, that's probably a pretty good situation. Yeah. <laughs> So, in about six months, the Carleton class of 2011 is going to graduate. Some of them know exactly what they want to do, and others are confused, stressed, and clueless. <laughs> do you have any advice? Yeah, I would say come here. Okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> for, for both. <laughs> yeah. The ones, the ones who think they know what they want to do are sometimes just... Don't admit they're confused. <laughs> well, <clears throat> one of the ways that everyone can make a positive difference <clears throat> is to work on their own purity of consciousness. Because uh, as long as we have tendencies towards greed in our heart, then it, can, it will manifest. And so much of the problems in the world have come from just excessive desire, um, just manifested exponentially um, through societies and corporations and billions of people. <clears throat> you can see how it's just caused so many problems environmentally, etc. So 
So, um, learning how to be content is something that doesn't just come because it's a good idea, but it actually takes uh, some mental training or contemplation, uh, looking at life in, in different ways, and reducing anger. Uh, you know, that's obviously beneficial for everyone around us. You know, if, if, uh, if we're more patient and forgiving and kind and loving and, um, and not prone to being uh, angry, then uh, that's a great gift to all of our friends and family. And ripples from that go out. You know? So even if you have uh, a few people who are just living a, a normal a normal life, a normal family life, if they're doing it with uh, a pure heart, then that's already uh, has effects, has positive effects in the world. So those are those are some ways that uh, people can do something which is both beneficial for themselves and also beneficial for others. And not to rush into a career. The, uh, my early twenties, you know, I, I've, I look back on those and I feel very grateful that I allowed myself um, to travel, uh, to feel no pressure, to have to get in Involved very quickly in a career, uh, you know, I did. I did so many things that I really loved doing. It was just wonderful experience. And you know, I, I, when I was in high school and college, every summer I'd save up a bit of money. So by the time I graduated, I actually had um, you know enough money that I could live very simply. But but you travel and move around and just do a lot of the things that. Uh, laid a really good foundation for whatever I was going to do later in life. Mm -hmm. yeah. I suppose the, the uh, best advice that I followed was, was allowing myself to follow my heart and just trusting that that was okay because rationally we can well, lots of reasons why we, we should do th certain things, and, or there may be pressure from family or society or just from within ourselves to feel that we should follow um, certain paths, traditional paths. But what's more important, and definitely what's going to lead to one's happiness, as well as I think what's really going to work, is when people look into their hearts and say, you know, what's important to me? And then be willing to follow up their heart. So what have I gained from this whole experience? To start on a personal level, I've laid a foundation for improving focus and inner tranquility through meditation and an understanding of what it really means to be happy. And that translates to how one can think about a career that they want to follow. In terms of making a meaningful career for yourself, once you have a roof over your head, clothes on your back, and some food on your plate, the more stuff you accumulate doesn't really impact how happy you're going to be. So the more zeros you have in your bank account, the more green you have in your pocket, it's really not the, the way to go. Because life satisfaction is ultimately about finding an activity for which you are present and which serves a cause greater than yourself. Helping others, helping the environment, helping animals, whatever that may be, it starts also with helping yourself. And that's what this retreat to the Muti Buddhist Monastery has given me, an opportunity to help build inner peace, inner strength, and concentration that can radiate out into everyone else with whom I interact. Thanks a lot, Carlton.